Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in the Trick Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing Vega 10, Vega 20, and Navi. That's right, some internal slides have leaked out onto the internets, and I figured it would be a pretty awesome idea for us to go through them. Now, there are a couple of little caveats. First of all, Vega 10 represents the high end for now. Vega 20 is the card which is supposedly going to debut in 2018. So these cards are essentially going to be the equivalent of like the Furies, the very bleeding edge. The second thing I'd like to point out is that a number of people have messaged me asking if I can just put a video together which goes into kind of details of all we've learned about Vega all the details we've learned about Ryzen with CES and kind of tally everything together. And the answer is I will do that. I have, however, been waiting for CES as well as possibly a day or two after for all the rumours, all the speculation to kind of die down. And then we can put together something which tells us all we've learned and what we've not learned. Anywho, let's start, shall we? So starting from the top, which is Vega 10 first. Now remember, we have learned that these are brand new architectures. <clears throat> so... With that in mind, 14nm GFX9 architecture, 64 compute units at 2 times rate FP16, 1 16th rate DPFP. Uh, float 16 performance is 24 teraflops. Bear in mind that is half precision. So in short, they are once again advertising the fact that if they are, if you are running code which is half precision, only needs half precision float, you're going to get double the performance of the GPU. Regular float is about 12 teraflops, whereas if you double, f um, then you're looking at about 750 GF, which is pretty much what you'd expect. It basically falls in line. Um, HW page management support, two stacks of HBM2, which is looking at 512 gigabytes per second, unsurprising, since we're um, obviously looking at each stack a double the, uh, double the uh, clock speed. However, because you've only got a two stack, it's still the same amount of memory bandwidth as the four stack of the previous Fury. Uh, so that's 16 gigabytes of memory. PCIe generation free, which is 16 times, 225 watts of power. It's not unlimited power. And there's also going to be a Vega 10, which is going to be the dual part. And now this one is very interesting because it is still sporting the 64 compute units of the previous one, 14nm, it is essentially the same card, but just doubled up. 200, sorry, 300 watts of power, PCIe generation uh, 3 times 16, no surprises there. 4 stack HBM2, 1 terabyte per second. I'm going to make the assumption that this is going to be split down the middle, so there's going to be 2 stacks for one GPU, 2 stacks for the other GPU, and obviously... Um, well, it's going to be ridiculously fast. Vega 20 is supposedly going to be hitting in the second half of 2018. Now, Vega 20 is going to shrink things down to just 7 nanometers, which is just, just bonkers. And it is going to sport 64 compute units. Now, supposedly there is going to be a change here because they're going to move to the newer standard of PCIe, which will be Generation 4, which pretty much increases the uh, bandwidth, of course, of the connection. So, essentially, your GPU and the rest of the system can share data at about twice the rate, depending on the host connection. In this, in this case, the GPU will, of course, sport up to time 16, therefore pretty shiny. It will, however, have four stacks HBM2 memory, one terabyte per second. <sighs> one terabyte per second memory bandwidth, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go. 16 to 32 gigabytes of memory. Just, just think of that. I mean, I, I just want, just, just stop the video for a second and just think of what it used to be like, like 10 years ago, how much memory we used to have on a GPU. No, forget the GPU. Just forget the GPU. Think how much memory you used to have in your system. I remember back, like, in the late 90s, I had a PC which had, like, 128 megabytes of main system memory and a Voodoo 2 which had 12 megabytes and then I upgraded to the Voodoo 3 which had 16 megabytes and I was damn well proud of that 16 megabytes of VRAM. Anyway, um... Naturally, it's still going to have 64 CU at 2 times rate FP16, half rate uh, DPFP, 
uh, which is du double position floating point, just to clarify, and EDC slash ECC. So it looks like it's got some type of error correction in there, which I'm going to assume is going to primarily be for compute purposes. I'm also going to make the assumption that it's going to be primarily um, a small tweak to the architecture. So I'm going to make the a guess it's going to be kind of like an incremental update to the GPU. I'm guessing that, but possibly extra clock speed. And in addition to that, we have rather impressive changes to the um, GPU itself because it's going to have XGMI support. So it's got peer-to-peer -peer GPU communication. So I'm assuming that's where the GPUs themselves are going to connect to one another. Talking about Vega and Navi. Now, we don't really know super amounts about Navi. And to say we don't know super amounts is me being incredibly generous. All we know about Navi is that, well, it has next generation memory support. What's that? I don't know, because they haven't said. Logically, we can say it's HBM3, or possibly GDDR6 or above, but it's most likely going to be HBM3. And the second thing is they've said it's scalable. I'm going to make an assumption that that means it's going to better be able to connect multiple GPUs to one another, almost like daisy chaining. How that works, I've no idea. And also, these are primarily going to be server GPUs, so there's obviously that to remember. And this is where they're really pushing the deep learning side of things as well. Um, so there is that to take into consideration. Okay, so I know I'm going to get some people asking my opinions on this stuff, and I'm also going to get some questions regarding the specifications. Now, I've already gone into the architecture of Vega, so I don't really want to spend too long going into that again, because once again, it kind of feels like I'm wasting your time. But what I will go into is a little bit about the GPU performance and also some of the new stuff. Uh, just kind of a touch-up, if you will. Not in a dirty way. Maybe. Um, so regarding the clock speed, you don't have to be amazing at math. You just do 64 times 64, and then you times that by 2. And then if you put in a speed of around the 1500 mark, you get the 12 T-flops of computing performance. I would also make the assumption, and I'm basing this on their previous lineup, that there's going to be like the equivalent of the Fury and the Fury X. Now, the Fury X, I think, had, sorry, the Fury X had 4096 cores, while the Fury, I'm probably going to get this number wrong, but it's like 3584 memory. Uh, sorry, uh, um, not CUDA cores, uh, uh, compute units. So basically, uh, sorry, stream processors, not compute units. That would be very impressive. So we can probably make the assumption that for the regular, plain old Fury equivalent of the Vega 10, you're looking at probably around the, I'm going to probably say around the 10-ish T-flop mark, between 9 and 10. I say ish because obviously it depends on if they decide to have lower clock speeds. If memory serves, the Fury... I'll, remember to annotate it, but if memory serves, the Fury X had, I think, 1,050, and the regular Fury had 1,000. Possibly wrong on that. So, there is obviously that small discrepancy between them. I'm assuming they were doing a little bit of speed binning on that one, but the actual memory between the original Fury and Fury X were the same. They were still using the HBM1 memory at 512 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, so I'm going to make I'm not going to make an assumption, but it's possible that the very high-end card is going to have the 8 gigabytes, sorry, the 16 gigabytes, whereas the lower-end card, they're just going to put in 8 gigabytes. So, in short, the equivalent of the Fury might have 8 gigabytes of HBM2, and the higher-end card is going to have 16. But that is me speculating. That is not confirmed with these slides. I'm simply, you know, kind of throwing out information there. Do remember, there is that um, HBCC controller, sorry, high bandwidth um, cache controller. Now, what that does, as I talked about just a few days ago, or actually yesterday, it essentially acts like virtual memory. What it does is it's a, basically a processor which predicts, as far as we understand it, not huge amounts of information have been revealed on exactly how it works, but the gist of it is that the processor will act as a prediction and try to grab data 
or page data back into a um, virtual memory, which the GPU doesn't require. So, for example, it's essentially streaming data into the GPU, and this is in addition to the memory which is actually already attached to the GPU. So, for example, you've got 16 gigabytes of memory which is local, but you've also got up to 512 terabytes of virtual memory. Now, obviously, if this is probably not going to be so helpful if you've got a slow-ass you know, hard drive, but if you've got something like an M2 drive or even faster, which would be ideal, then by golly gosh, you're probably in for a pretty good time. How well that's going to work and how much of a difference it makes in reality, I don't know. It might be quite helpful for folding at home or other such um, compute type of operations, but we'll only have to figure that out. But do remember, and this is one of the final things I want to say about this, these numbers, the float point and all of the stuff is not indicative of a GPU which you have now. So, for example, Polaris, the RX 480, puts out about 60 flops. I always say about because it's slightly more or slightly less depending on the model you go for. So, about 60 flops. That's with 36 compute units um, and a clock speed of around 1266 to the low 1300s if you go with one of the, the pre overclocked models. What that means essentially is that you've only got double the performance in terms of raw T-flops, but remember that this GPU has numerous ar numerous architecture changes, and those include those changes that we saw with 116th rate DPFP. Um, they've made various changes when it comes to the geometry processing, prediction, and just basically, they've done a complete radical redesign of the, GPC, of the GCN architecture. As I said just yesterday, this is probably about the biggest single change of an AMD graphics card's architecture since the introduction of when they basically went to the GCN uh, cards originally. So when the 7000 series essentially debuted and they went from um, the, uh, you know, the older cards... And it's kind of crazy, really, that they've made so many changes. It was almost like Polaris was there getting their feet wet, trying to figure out what worked and what didn't. And it probably explains some of the lower clock speeds. This also pretty much confirms the clocks of um, the Vega graphics cards being a lot higher. And one can make the assumption which essentially this is all it is, an assumption that this will trickle down to lower end parts as well. Now, the lower end parts are unfortunately not mentioned in these slides, but one can probably predict that they are going to be Vega 11, and they are going to comprise numerous GPUs. I don't know, obviously, what those specifications are going to be. I'm probably going to predict, however, that they're going to have like the high 2000 uh, number of uh, shaders, so you're probably looking at a number of compute units of, you know, the the mid-40s-ish, at a rough guess. I'm saying ish because they might change it, obviously, uh, for the next generation. They might decide to go a little bit lower. And that does lead me to wonder how that's going to fit in with Polaris, what they're going to do with the Polaris architecture. Are they going to retire it? Are they simply just going to go to the uh, 500 series and say, you know, thanks for the service, 400 series. You've, you've been an absolute blast. And to be fair... No one can deny that Polaris has done AMD a really good service. It's helped keep them financially stable, or at least has put them more financially stable. It's helped win them over in terms of gamers. And as I mentioned in my Crimson Relive review, the drivers, the revisions they've made of, of those drivers, is pretty substantial. One can make a very compelling argument that if the Crimson Relive drivers especially the latter ones, the ones that have just been released, I can't remember their version number is offhand, but if they had been out when the GTX 1060 had launched, NVIDIA probably would have been a lot less confident, because basically the RX 480 performance, if you could do some googling on this, but the RX 80, 480 performance has gone up by about 10%. Now what I want to know, and this is very off topic, what I want to know from NVIDIA is what are they going to do to counter AMD? And I want them to counter AMD. That's the thing. Because as much as I want AMD to succeed, I also don't want the only choice in each of my videos or each comment or each person who messaged me when they're like, what graphics card? Well, you need this AMD card because it's A, not great for the customer and B, 
it doesn't give you choice. Because what really sucks is if you like a lot of features from one graphics card manufacturer, for example, let's just for example say that you've got a nice uh, G-Sync monitor, but you know, these cards come out and, and, and NVIDIA have nothing to counter them, then you're basically forced to, to jump to AMD. And that sucks if you've got a FreeSync monitor, oh, sorry, a G-Sync monitor, and, the, and it's also the reverse if you've invested into a FreeSync monitor. So that's why I like both companies to be competitive, because I think it's great for the industry. And it's also one of the reasons that I do want, as much as I want AMD to rabbit punch Intel, so that... Intel get its finger out when it comes to the number of cores for the mainstream. I don't want AMD to be the only choice for gamers because it's not healthy and it breeds complacency in the marketplace, at least in my opinion. But that's just, you know, essentially my thoughts on the subject. Anyway, I probably went a bit too much onto this particular thing. I didn't really mean to drag that on tomorrow, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. I shall see you all soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.